Chapter 12 Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn Disadvantages of living in same house with pair of lovers A trying time for the English nation A night search for the picturesque Homeless and houseless Harris prepares to die An angel comes along Effect of sudden joy on Harris A little supper Lunch High price for mustard A fearful battle Maidenhead Sailing Three fishers We are cursed I was sitting on the bank, conjuring up this scene to myself, when George remarked that when I was quite rested, perhaps I would not mind helping to wash up, and thus recalled from the days of the glorious past to the prosaic present, with all its misery and sin, I slid down into the boat and cleaned out the frying pan with a stick of wood and a tuft of grass, polishing it up finely with George's wet shirt. We went over to Magna Carta Island and had a look at the stone which stands in the cottage there and on which the great charter is said to have been signed, though as to whether it really was signed there or, as some say, on the other bank at Running Mead, I declined to commit myself. As far as my own personal opinion goes, however, I am inclined to give weight to the popular island theory. Certainly, had I been one of the barons... At the time, I should have strongly urged upon my comrades the advisability of our getting such a slippery customer as King John onto the island, where there was less chance of surprises and tricks. There are the ruins of an old priory in the grounds of Anchor Wyke House, which is close to Picnic Point, and it was round about the grounds of this old priory that Henry VIII is said to have waited for and met Anne Boleyn. He also used to meet her at Hever Castle in Kent, and also somewhere near St. Albans. It must have been difficult for the people of England in those days to have found a spot where these thoughtless young folk were not spooning. Have you ever been in a house where there are a couple courting? It is most trying. You think you will go and sit in the drawing room and you march off there. As you open the door, you hear a noise as if somebody had suddenly recollected something. And, when you get in, Emily is over by the window, full of interest in the opposite side of the road. And your friend, John Edward, is at the other end of the room with his whole soul held in thrall by photographs of other people's relatives. Oh, you say, pausing at the door. I didn't know anybody was here. Oh, didn't you? says Emily coldly, in a tone which implies she does not believe you. You hang about for a bit, then you say, It's very dark. Why don't you light the gas? John Edward says, Oh, uh, he hadn't noticed. And Emily says, Papa does not like the gas lit in the afternoon. You tell them one or two items of news, and give them your views and opinions on the Irish question, but this does not appear to interest them. All they remark on any subject is, Oh, is it? Did he? Yes. And you don't say so. And after ten minutes of such style of conversation, you edge up to the door and slip out and are surprised to find that the door immediately closes behind you and shuts itself without your having touched it. Half an hour later, you think you will try a pipe in the conservatory. The only chair in the place is occupied by Emily and John Edward, if the language of clothes can be relied upon, has evidently been sitting on the floor. They do not speak, but they give you a look that says all that can be said in a civilized community, and you back out promptly and shut the door behind you. You are afraid to poke your nose into any room in the house now, so after walking up and down the stairs for a while, you go and sit in your own bedroom. This becomes uninteresting, however, after a time, and so you put on your hat and stroll out into the garden, you walk down the path, and as you pass the summer house, you glance in, and there are those two young idiots huddled up into one corner of it, and they see you and are evidently under the idea that, for some wicked purpose of your own, you are following them about. Why don't they have a special room for this sort of thing and make people keep to it, you mutter. And you rush back to the hall and, and get your umbrella and go out. It must have been much like this when that foolish boy, Henry VIII, was courting his little Anne. 
People in Buckinghamshire would have come upon them unexpectedly when they were mooning round Windsor and Raysbury, and have exclaimed, Oh, you here? And Henry would have blushed and said, Yes, he'd just come over to see a man. And Anne would have said, Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Isn't it funny? I've just met Mr. Henry VIII in the lane, and he's going the same way I am. Then those people would have gone away and said to themselves, Oh, we'd better get out of here while this is billing and cooing is on. We'll go down to Kent. And they would go down to Kent, and the first thing they would see in Kent when they got there would be Henry and Anne fooling round Hever Castle. Oh, drat this, they would have said. Here, let's go away. I can't stand any more of this. Let's go to St. Albans. Nice, quiet place, St. Albans. And when they reached St. Albans, there would be that wretched couple kissing under the abbey walls. Then these folks would go and be pirates until the marriage was over. Fortunately for them, a short time. From Picnic Point to Old Windsor Lock is a delightful bit of the river. A shady road dotted here and there with dainty little cottages runs by the bank up to the Bells of Oosley, a picturesque inn, as most upriver inns are, and a place where a very good glass of ale may be drunk, so Harris says, and on a matter of this kind you can take Harris's word. Old Windsor is a famous spot in its way. Edward the Confessor had a palace here, and here the great Earl Godwin was proved guilty by the justice of that age of having encompassed the death of the king's brother. Earl Godwin broke a piece of bread and held it in his hand. If I am guilty, said the earl, may this bread choke me when I eat it. Then he put the bread into his mouth and swallowed it, and it choked him, and he died. After you pass Old Windsor, the river is somewhat uninteresting and does not become itself again until you are nearing Boveni. George and I towed up past the home park, which stretches along the right bank from Albert to Victoria Bridge. And as we were passing Datchet, George asked me if I remembered our first trip up the river and when we landed at Datchet at 10 o'clock at night and wanted to go to bed. I answered that I did remember it. It will be some time before I forget it. It was the Saturday before the August bank holiday. We were tired and hungry, we same three. And when we got to Datchet, we took out the hamper, the two bags and the rugs and coats and such like things and started off to look for diggings. We passed a very pretty little hotel with clematis and creeper over the porch, but there was no honeysuckle about it. And for some reason or other, I had got my mind fixed on honeysuckle. And I said, oh, don't let's go in there. Let's go on a bit further and see if there isn't one with honeysuckle over it. So we went on till we came to another hotel. That was a very nice hotel too, and it had honeysuckle on it, round at the side, but Harris did not like the look of a man who was leaning, leaning against the front door. He said he didn't look a nice man at all, and he wore ugly boots, so we went on further. We went a goodish way without coming across any more hotels, and then we met a man and asked him to direct us to a few. He said, Why, you are coming away from them. You must turn right round and go back, and then you will come to the stag. We said, Oh, we had been there and didn't like it. No honeysuckle over it. Well, then he said, There's the manor house just opposite. Have you tried that? Harris replied that we did not want to go there, didn't like the looks of the man who was stopping there. Harris did not like the color of his hair, didn't like his boots either. Well, I don't know what you'll do, I'm sure, said our informant, because they are the only two inns in the place. No other inns, exclaimed Harris. None, replied the man. What on earth are we to do, cried Harris. Then George spoke up. He said Harris and I could go, could get an hotel built for us, if we liked, and have some people made to put in. For his part, he was going back to the stag. The greatest minds never realize their ideals in any matter, and Harris and I sighed over the hollowness of all earthly desires and followed George. We took our traps into the stag and laid them down in the hall. The landlord came up and said, Good evening, gentlemen. Oh, good evening, said George. We want three beds, please. 
Very sorry, sir, said the landlord, but I'm afraid we can't manage it. Oh, well, never mind, said George. Two will do. Two of us can sleep in one bed, can't we? He continued, turning to Harris and me. Harris said, oh, yes. He thought George and I could sleep in one bed very easily. Very sorry, sir, again repeated the landlord. But we really haven't got a bed vacant in the whole house. In fact, we are putting two and even three gentlemen in one bed as it is. This staggered us for a bit. But Harris, who is an old traveler, rose to the occasion and, laughing cheerily, said, Oh, well, we can't help it. We must rough it. You must give us a shakedown in the billiard room. Very sorry, sir. Three gentlemen sleeping on the billiard table already, and two in the coffee room. Can't possibly take you in tonight. We picked up our things and went over to the manor house. It was a pretty little place. I said I thought I should like it better than the other house, and Harris said, Oh, yes, it would be all right, and we needn't look at the man with the red hair. Besides, the poor fellow couldn't help having red hair. Amen. Harris spoke quite kindly and sensibly about it. The people at the manor house did not wait to hear us talk. The landlady met us on the doorstep with the greeting that we were the 14th party she had turned away within the last hour and a half. As for our meek suggestions of stables, billiard room, or coal cellars, she laughed them all to scorn. All these nooks had been snatched up long ago. Did she know of any place in the whole village where we could get shelter for the night? Well, if she didn't mind, if we didn't mind roughing it, she did not recommend it, mind. But there was a little beer shop half a mile down the Eaton Road. We waited to hear no more. We caught up the hamper and the bags and the coats and the rugs and parcels and ran. The distance seemed more like a mile than half a mile, but we reached the place at last and rushed, panting into the bar. The people at the beer shop were rude. They merely laughed at us. There were only three beds in the whole house, and they had seven single gentlemen and two married couples sleeping there already. A kind-hearted kind -hearted bargeman, however, who happened to be in the tap room, thought we might try the grocer's next door to the stag, and we went back. The grocer's was full. An old woman we met in the shop then kindly took us along with her for a quarter of a mile to a lady friend of hers who occasionally let rooms to gentlemen. This old woman walked very slowly, and we were 20 minutes getting to her lady friends. She enlivened the journey by describing to us, as we trailed along, the various pains she had in her back. Her lady friend's rooms were let. From there, we were recommended to number 27. Number 27 was full and sent us to number 32. And 32 was full. Then we went back into the high road, and Harris sat down on the hamper and said he would go no further. He said it seemed a quiet spot, and he would like to die there. He requested George and me to kiss his mother for him and to tell all his relations that he forgave them and died happy. At that moment, an angel came by in the disguise of a small boy, and I cannot think of any more effective disguise an angel could have assumed, with a can of beer in one hand and in the other something at the end of a string, which he let down onto every flat stone he came across and then pulled it up again, thus producing a peculiar, peculiarly unattractive sound, suggestive of suffering. We asked this heavenly messenger, as we discover him here afterwards to be, if he knew of any lonely house whose occupants were few and feeble, old ladies or paralyzed gentlemen preferred, who could eas be easily frightened into giving up their beds for the night to three desperate men. Or if not this, could he recommend us to an empty pigsty or a disused lime kiln or anything of that sort? He did not know of any such place, at least not one handy. But he said that, if we liked to come with him, his mother had a room to spare and could put us up for the night. We fell upon his neck there in the moonlight and blessed him, and it would have made a very beautiful picture if the boy himself had not been so overpowered by our emotion as to be unable to sustain himself under it, and sunk to the ground, letting us all down on top of him. Harris was so overcome with joy that he fainted and had to seize the boy's beer can and half empty it before he could recover consciousness, and then he started off at a run and left George and me to bring on the luggage. 
It was a little four-roomed cottage where the boy lived, and his mother, good soul, gave us hot bacon for supper. Mm. And we ate it all, five pounds, and a jam tart afterwards, and two pots of tea, and then we went to bed. There were two beds in the room. One was a two-foot, six-inch truckle bed, and George and I slept in that, and kept in by tying ourselves together with a sheet. And the other was the little boy's bed, and Harris had that all to himself, and we found him in the morning with two feet of bare legs sticking out at the bottom, and George and I used it to hang the towels while we bathed. We were not so uppish about what sort of hotel we would have next time we went to Datchet. To return to our present trip, nothing exciting happened, and we tugged steadily on to a little below Monkey Island, where we drew up and lunched. We tackled the cold beef for lunch, and then we found that we had forgotten to bring any mustard. I don't think I ever in my life, before or since, felt I wanted mustard as badly as I felt I wanted it then. I don't care for mustard as a rule, and it is very seldom that I take it at all, but I would have given worlds for it then. I don't know how many worlds there may be in the universe, but anyone who had brought me a spoonful of mustard at that precise moment could have had them all. I grow reckless like that when I want a thing and can't get it. Harris said he would have given worlds for mustard too. It would have been a good thing for anybody who had come up to that spot with a can of mustard then. He would have been set up in worlds for the rest of his life. But there, I dare say both Harris and I would have tried to back out of the bargain after we had got the mustard. One makes these extravagant offers in moments of excitement. But of course, when one comes to think of it, one sees how absurdly out of proportion they are with the value of the required article. I heard a man going up a mountain of, in Switzerland once say he would give worlds for a glass of beer. And when he came to a little shanty where they kept it, he kicked up a most fearful row because they charged him five francs for a bottle of bass. He said it was a scandalous imposition, and he wrote to the Times about it. It cast a gloom over the boat, there being no mustard. We ate our beef in silence. Existence seemed hollow and uninteresting. We thought of the happy days of childhood and sighed. We brightened up a bit, however, over the apple tart. And when George drew out a tin of pineapple from the bottom of the hamper and rolled it into the middle of the boat, we felt that life was worth living after all. We are very fond of pineapple, all three of us. We looked at the picture on the tin we thought of the juice. We smiled at one another, and Harris got a spoon ready. Then we looked for the knife to open the tin with. We turned out everything in the hamper. We turned out the bags. We pulled up the boards at the bottom of the boat. We took everything out onto the bank and shook it. There was no tin opener to be found. Then Harris tried to open the tin with a pocket knife and broke the knife and cut himself badly. And George tried a pair of scissors and the scissors flew up and nearly put his eye out. While they were dressing their wounds, I tried to make a hole in the thing with the spiky end of the hitcher. And the hitcher slipped and jerked me out between the boat and the bank into two feet of muddy water. And the tin rolled over uninjured and broke a teacup. Then we all got out. Then we all got mad. We took that tin out on the bank and Harris went up into a field and got a big sharp stone. And I went back into the boat and brought out the mast. And George held the tin and Harris held the sharp end of his stone against the top of it. And I took the mast and poised it high up in the air and gathered up all my strength and brought it down. It was George's straw hat that saved his life that day. He keeps that hat now, what is left of it. And... Of a winter's evening when the pipes are lit and the boys are telling stretchers about the dangers they have passed through. George brings it down and shows it round and the stirring tale is told anew with fresh exaggerations every time. Harris got off with merely a flesh wound. After that, I took the tin off myself and hammered at it with the mask till I was worn out and sick at heart, whereupon Harris took it in hand. 
We beat it out flat. We beat it back square. We battered it into every form known to geometry, but we could not make a hole in it. Then George went at it and knocked it into a shape so strange, so weird, so unearthly in its wild hideousness that he got frightened and threw away the mast. Then we all three sat round it on the grass and looked at it. There was one great dent across the top that hid the appearance of a mocking grin, and it drove us furious so that Harris rushed at the thing and caught it up and flung it as far into the middle of the river, and as it sank, we hurled our curses at it, and we got into the boat and rowed away from the spot and never paused till we reached Maidenhead. Maidenhead itself is too snobby to be pleasant. It is the haunt of the river swell and his overdressed female companion. It is a town of showy hotels, patronized chiefly by dudes and ballet girls. It is the witch's kitchen from which go forth those demons of the river steam launches. The London Journal Duke always has his little place at Maidenhead, and the heroine of the three-volume novel always dines there when she goes out on the spree with somebody else's husband. We went through Maidenhead quickly, and then eased up and took leisurely that grand reach beyond bolters and cookum locks. Cliveden Woods still wore their dainty dress of spring and rose up from the water's edge in one long harmony of blended shades of fairy green. In its unbroken loveliness, this is, perhaps, the sweetest stretch of all the river. And lingeringly, we slowly drew our little boat away from its deep peace. We pulled up in the backwater, just below Cookham, and had tea. And when we were through the lock, it was evening. A stiffish breeze had sprung up, in our favor for a wonder, for as a rule on the river, the wind is always dead against you whatever way you go. It is against you in the morning when you start for a day's trip. And you pull a long distance, thinking how easy it will be to come back with the sail. Then after tea, the wind veers round and you have to pull hard in its teeth all the way home. When you forget to take the sail at all, then the wind is consistently in your favor both ways. But there, this world is only a probation and man was born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. This evening, however, they had evidently made a mistake and to put the wind round at her back instead of in our face. We kept very quiet about it and got the sail up quickly before they found it out, and then we spread ourselves about the boat in thoughtful attitudes, and the sail bellied out and strained and grumbled at the mast, and the boat flew. I steered. There is no more thrilling sensation I know of than sailing. It comes as near to flying as man has got to yet, except in dreams. The wings of the rushing wind seem to be bearing you onward, and you know not where. You are no longer the slow, plodding, puny thing of clay creeping tortuously upon the ground. You are a part of nature. Your heart is throbbing against hers. Her glorious arms are round you, raising you up against her heart. Your spirit is at one with hers. Your limbs grow light. The voices of the air are singing to you. The earth seems far away and little, and the clouds so close above your head are brothers, and you stretch your arms to them. We had the river to ourselves, except that far in the distance we could see a fishing punt moored in midstream on which three fishermen sat, and we skimmed over the water and passed the wooded banks, and no one spoke. I was steering. As we drew nearer, we could see that the three men fishing seemed old and solemn-looking men. They sat on three chairs in the punt and watched intently their lines, and the red sunset threw a mystic light upon the waters and tinged with fire the towering woods and made a golden glory of tile piled up clouds. It was an hour of deep enchantment, of ecstatic hope and longing. The little sail stood out against the purple sky, the gloaming lay around us, wrapping the world in sh rainbow shadows, and behind us crept the night. We seemed like knights of some old legend, sailing across some mystic lake into the unknown realm of twilight, unto the great land of the sunset. We did not go into the realm of twilight. We went slap into that punt where those three 
old men were fishing. We did not know what had happened at first, because the sail shut out the view, but from the nature of the language that rose up upon the evening air, we gathered that we had come into the neighborhood of human beings, and that they were vexed and discontented. Harris let the sail down, and then we saw what had happened. We had knocked those three old gentlemen off their chairs into a general heap at the bottom of the boat, and they were now slowly and painfully sorting themselves out from each other and picking fish off themselves, and, as they were, they cursed us, not with a common cursory curse, but with long, carefully thought-out, comprehensive curses that embraced the whole of our career and went away into the distant future and included all our relations and covered everything connected with us. Good, substantial curses. Harris told them they ought to be grateful for a little excitement sitting there fishing all day, and he also said that he was shocked and grieved to hear men their age give way to temper so. But it did not do any good. George said he would steer after that. He said a mind like mine ought not to be expected to give itself away in steering boats. Better let a mere commonplace human being see after that boat before we jolly well all got drowned, and he took the lines and brought us up to Marlow. And at Marlow we left the boat by the bridge and went and put up for the night at the Crown. <laughs>